The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room that's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks, and welcome to another edition of The Engine Room. Today is quite exciting because some... Many months ago, I sat down with this uh, gentleman in his office, and we had a bit of a, a chat. And uh, he was he was holding a bit of a secret. So at the time, um, he had one financial planning practice, very successful in Sydney. And then about uh, three or four weeks ago, I'm reading the paper, and uh, it was launched that he'd merged four firms together in Sydney, moved offices, and now has what would some would say is a a super firm. In, in Sydney. So um, the research for this is, uh, has been a bit more cumbersome, but um, without any further ado, I'd firstly like to congratulate you. Um, you're probably going to give me some war stories and welcome you to the podcast, Matthew Fenning, the CEO of the new business, Essentia. Yeah, thanks for having me, Andrew. And, and many people would know you from AdviceWise, and, and Essentia is so fresh, as we've said, you've, you've just got the website coming, it's, it's ready to go. Um, and, and we will get to um, uh, how you've managed to pull that off um, because there are many listeners out there that have either done an exercise like this um, or are thinking about it. Um, but before we do that, it'd be good to get to know you. You know, you had a great firm that ostensibly was award-winning, um, was very profitable, etc. but you wanted to drive more. And that quite often comes from your background, you know, where you started, what drives you. And what I'd like to know is what 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 drove you to get into financial planning because it wasn't your first career, and what what is that fire in the belly come from, or where does it come from? Sorry. Yeah. Look. So I think for me, uh, my my background prior to financial advice was in various types of consulting. So I was in uh, headhunting for a while. I was in IT consulting, uh, management consulting. Uh, and uh, I think towards the, the tail end of that, um, I was in a general management role in a, a pretty large firm, uh, was coming to the end of uh, my MBA. And I think that that was an inflection point for me. What do I, what do I want to be doing with the next 20 or 30 years of my life? Do I want to be climbing the corporate ladder? Um, do I want to be, uh, I suppose, carving out my own path? And, you know, I gave a lot of thought to that. Uh, and uh, I suppose one of uh, one of the things uh, about me is I'm not great at being told what to do. Uh, so uh, yeah, going out on my own was, you know, a, a natural thing to do. Uh, why why financial advice? Uh, our family has a history in it. So uh, you know, multiple generations over you know thirty odd years, and uh, you know, I'd like to think has um, you know built and is continuing to build. A legacy, um, but I think it was the fundamentals. So, were you the black sheep of the family when you weren't in the industry? Uh, uh, look, I, I was late, uh, a late comer. I'm uh, brother number two. I'm the oldest of four, so brother number two is probably the black sheep these days. He's over at uh, Macquarie as an accountant, but uh, brother number three is also a partner in the business, and brother number four a, a shareholder. So. 
you know, we've all we've all uh, found ourselves gravitating towards us and uh, towards it and landing there. So, you know, I, I think that uh, it's fun to be able to work, you know, with with your brothers each day. That was, you know, certainly a part of what Advise Wise was about and what Essentia continues to be about for me. But I, yeah, look, I, I think for for why financial advice. The fundamentals of financial advice uh, as a prospect have always been great. We've got a, a you know a world class retirement system. We've got uh, an aging population of advisors. That that means there's a lot of opportunity to come through uh, for you know younger people like me uh, to to be that next generation of advisors. Uh, so I I think that. Um, you know, those things were the, the drivers for me going, well, um, let's let's kick off in, in financial advice. So uh, I started in a, a program you'd be familiar with. I did the AMP Horizons program, I think, 11 years ago now. So many alumni. I've got uh, two or three of the fellow directors in Ensemble um, went through that program. There you go, with uh, Ben Nash being a, a notable advisor who's still playing his trade. Yeah, okay, okay. And look, that... That were as as someone who was experienced in working with clients uh, in a, a relationship sense, it was really good to go through that program and uh, help build the technical skills. Uh, and and from there, uh, I was I was lucky enough that uh, Ray Miles over at, at Fortnum uh, let me kick off from scratch. So all oh, right. So uh, so you got the question. So now that you're at the other end of the spectrum, where you're looking to hire and bring through people. Do you miss the concept of something like the Horizons Academy in the industry? Uh, personally, I'd like to think that uh, in our process, we've we've borrowed or I've borrowed uh, some old enhanced uh, is the word. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, so uh, I think one of one of the things that that I, I found really useful there is that they used professional actors. Uh, and we we do that with all of our associate advisors. So oh they, wow! So you do the same thing? Yeah, oh, yeah, wow. yeah. So they get it. They get the same company. They get the the opportunity to work through that, um, so that they can uh, they can fail and fail fast and fail again. Wow! Uh, but but I think that you know role playing is one thing with a with a manager, but you know working with with trained actors with with a brief. Uh, is I think a really fruitful experience for the younger advisors coming through. So that you know that's an example of you know something that I took away from there that that I think uh, really makes a big difference uh, for the confidence of the younger advisors as they come through. I would absolutely love to see one of these trained actors in there going off script. You know, like the truth you can't handle the truth is uh, would would be quite good. So I'm not sure if you've got any blooper reels. From those, but they would be liquid gold. So when I when I looked at your your LinkedIn profile and my professional stalking capacity, you did your MBA prior to doing your professional financial advice qualifications. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So you've always been business minded first, and for reasons you had recently articulated as far as the financial planning um, uh, sort of landscape, you chose that. So what's interesting is although you started as an advisor, you've ended up being more of a business person pursuant to your first qualification. Yeah, look, I, I think in in my mind, I was always uh, or always the leader of the business, and being a financial advisor, um, which which I've really enjoyed and continue to enjoy, was a a part of the process uh, of realizing my vision for the business. So, to this day, I still work with. A small cohort of clients, uh, but with with the recent merger, I think I'm I'm now at a point where I can focus strategically on the growth of the business. Yeah, and look, the engine room's all about um, promoting that role, whether it be practice manager or, or hands on CEO, and and just getting a bit of a feel of how people have got to that realization. <laughs> Um, and before I cut you off, you mentioned that you you uh, Ray Miles gave you a bit of a shout out to. Uh, to Ray, and that's the the, the Fortnum group, um, and yet again, I think that group also spawned quite a few good quality businesses, some of which I interview all the time. Um, but um, what was the was there anything that sort of triggered you to get really passionate 
about financial advice? Because I've spoken to you previously and passion, you're in spades. Yeah, look, I, I think these ultimately it's it's the the fact that we get to have this really deep personal relationship with people. So you know that that that, that occurs on a person to person basis, but uh, and each of those is unique. Um, but the one that the one that always springs to mind for me is. You know, both both a a happy and a very sad story. Um, sort of a a client who um, a couple, um, lovely young family in their late thirties. Uh, he'd just be, be made partner at the time uh, in a big four accounting firm, uh, and uh, so everything was everything was flying along for them. You know, uh, kids going great at school, careers both going fantastically. Uh, and look, one day I get a call from him, uh, and he he says, "Look, I I need some help. I've got brain cancer." So we look, we we went through uh, the usual process that you go through as a, a financial advice firm, and I go through as an advisor. We did the the trauma claim that that was successful, which which. One that you go past, which you put in place, right? Yeah, absolutely. So let's, absolutely. let's, let's not underplay that because that. The trauma cover is there for a reason. Yeah, yeah, and look, the having comprehensive insurance would, you know, prove to be vital for a number of reasons. But one of what one of the things that I can do that I think makes what we do really different is uh, that it's it's really about um, us working with people to um, to change their lives, and change can be. Uh, a great thing, or it can be dealing with challenges in life. And look, this is certainly one of those. So, uh, look, he, um, uh, it, we went through that claim. Um, but the the other thing that that I did uh, that I think was the the most um, the most important thing that I did in in the whole process with him is uh, I I specialise in, amongst other things, working with medical specialists. So I said to him, look, I know you're getting treatment here. Um, I'll talk to a couple of my other clients um, without mentioning names and I'll get some feedback on is there someone else you should be talking to. So uh, I, uh, I had a chat with, with a client and, and he said, look, he needs, if he wants the best treatment, he's got to go see this guy in Texas. So money's no objective. Um, when we do trauma claims, one of the discussions typically is do do you want you know to be covered for for the basics or you know do you want the whole box and dice if if you need to go to the the US or Europe uh, and uh, you know you've got to pay a hundred percent of that um, you want that in place and and he had that in place so uh, he went he went to the US uh, he got a treatment that uh, wasn't available in Australia at the time. Uh, came back. Um, and what what year was this? Uh, this was uh, two thousand and eighteen. Okay. Yep. So uh, yeah, came back. Uh, tests were clear over the next six months, um, and they were back off and running. Uh, a, a year later, uh, I, I remember the day. I'm um, I'm sitting at my desk. It was just before Christmas. Um, I get a call. Um, from him again, and um, we we were due to to go to the cricket um, early in the new year, so assumed it was about that. Uh, and uh, when I answered, uh, his voice was quivering, um, and he said uh, that Matt, it's back. Diagnosis isn't good. They think I'm going to die. Shit. Yeah. Um, but but what he said to me was. Um, you know, it, it was probably my um, my proudest moment in in everything that I've done in the time that I've been an advisor. He said, "I want to thank you. you. You've given me this time with my family that I never would have got, and you know, I can't thank you enough." Um, so it wasn't about you know, it was great that we had the the numbers in order and we had the insurance there, but it, it was the thing that I did that. You know, wasn't the piece of financial advice. It was valuing that personal relationship and being able to use all the tools that I had available to help him 
um, that really made the difference to him. So, um, yeah, he, he passed away a few months later. What an amazing story, and, and thanks for sharing. Um, it's uh, sometimes, and I have said this previously on this um, podcast series, uh, it's a pity that more people outside the industry don't hear these stories because it's the real antidote from what the hyperbole is out there. And may I ask, um, who, who, if you don't mind mentioning, who was the insurance companies or people that you worked with that obviously did their job too, right? Yeah, so um, it was it was with Zurich and uh, they they did an excellent job. I think you know one of you talk about people outside the industry. I think one of one of the assumptions that people make a lot of the time with uh, with insurers is that they you know they're out to to not pay claims. How can I get out of this? Uh, they they were proactive with it. Um, they they could have been difficult. And and they weren't. The claim was paid really quickly, um, so you know that that made life a lot easier in a really difficult situation. Well, it would have been terrible the other way. And, and look, in all of my time advising, um, uh, I didn't have a problem with any claim where they'd been advised on the way in by a professional planner. It was only the direct stuff and the the group stuff where it was um, where they all thought yeah. they assumed, but it wasn't correct. So. Um, well, thank you for sharing that. And that was 2018. I think you kicked off advice wise 2015. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. And, um, so it wasn't too far into, um, you know, it's not supposed to happen this way either. You know, you, you, you always think of older people passing away. So that's, and that would also, I suppose, bring to my next question, which it gives you a, a real look at your own life and what you do outside of work. Um, and, and, you know, your family extended, you mentioned your brothers, but, Maybe give us a bit of a feel for what you do outside of work. Yeah, look, I think yeah, outside work, um, uh, I'm really focused on my family. So, um, you know, I I try really hard to uh, to make sure that uh, life is is balanced that way, and that I'm you know spending time with the kids. That's that's meaningful, and um, you know, I love getting to to their sport. What do they play? Uh, soccer. Yep. So uh, it's been a wet season in uh, Sydney town this year. Yeah, yeah, that's not very popular, is it? No, no. It's a bit of soccer. What else? Uh, so uh, they they all play soccer. Yep. Um, the youngest does gymnastics. So I've got I've got four kids. So that uh, that keeps me pretty busy. So oldest is uh, just about to finish cyber security at, at university. Yep. Um, got a budding designer in in high school, and uh, yeah, a couple of young ones. So you know, I, I think. Um, you know, one of one of the things that that I'm you know trying to do in what I do personally is you know provide an opportunity for my kids to go after um, what they want to go after and be who they want to be. Um, you know, I think that providing building a successful business uh, helps me provide them with a net so that you know they can take risks and they can fail um, without fear. And your brothers have been part of your your professional life. Um, do you see uh, do you see yourself more as a sort of a role model for your kids to go up for them to fulfil their own destiny, or do you think that potentially one of them might follow you into your business? Uh, look, look the I think the 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 first two I think the the path is is set, and I'm I'm happy for them to be doing what you know what they're talented at and what they're interested in. Uh, the, the youngest two, uh, so, um, uh, the number three is, is five. So at the moment, uh, that's pilot. Uh, the, the youngest one, maybe, I think, uh, uh, if, uh, the universe has done anything, it's, it's saved all the, um, the energy for, for the last one. <laughs> you know, get, they'll listen to this in 10 years time yeah, around yeah, Christmas yeah. and they'll go, you like that one? Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> no, I, I, I think that, uh, I think she's, she's definitely, you know, the most like me, but, yeah, uh, good. you know, hopefully they've all got, uh, the best bits and pieces yeah. and, uh, left the, the vices and whatnot at the door. No, no worries. And look, um, it's, um, uh, another example of, of, uh, you know, quite often in financial planning, we're 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 organising other people's lives, um, where um, whether they be wealth accumulators or grandparents or whatnot. But most financial planners quite often have got their own thing going on as well, um, and nothing, no one's perfect. And I'm mm-hmm. sure that um, 
you know, some days time management's a bit of a struggle like us all. I've got three kids and um, and, and other days it's not. But um, I, I wanted to maybe change gears now and, and get a bit of a feel for um, sort of how you run the practice. But before I did that, I wanted to quote actually your words. So um, as of uh, a month ago, it'd probably be two months by the time this comes out, guys, um, uh, I am excited to announce the form- formation of Essentia Wealth, resulting from the merger of AdviceWise Inside Private Wealth, Sovereign Wealth Partners, and Randall Advisory. There's four there, mate. That's that's a good one. Our four firms have come together to capture the opportunity in a divergent market to build a world-class advice business, one that enhances the existing ethos of each firm to use financial advice as a mechanism for changing lives. Now, that's what you wrote off the cup, cuff on a, on a LinkedIn post. Mm-hmm. Um, when did you get... When did you start the drive of wanting to build a bigger firm? Probably around the the Royal Commission. Uh, so uh, you know, you 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 mentioned earlier, you know, why why do it at all? And um, uh, my brother Sam and I were were ticking along. Business was doing really well. Um, it was growing at a a pretty good pace. Um, but we we felt we we got to a point where we had to think what what do we want to be long term? Do we want to continue along like this, uh, or do we want to do something differently strategically um, that that would involve much more inorganic growth? Uh, so we we felt that uh, it it needed to be the latter for us to build and leave the legacy that. That we want to leave, um, which is about you know changing clients' lives. Uh, so over over the next, or I suppose over the last couple of years, um, I kicked off a project to look at uh, uh, you know what uh, what friends were around in our uh, immediate uh, orbit that. You know, well, it's very immediate because it's all within a few blocks of each other. Yeah. When you when you look at the uh, the individual firms. Yeah, no, pretty short walk between the the four offices. Uh, so, so yeah, we we started those conversations about two years ago, and it it was really a case of we knew if we we're going to do something like this, and you know, having watched my late father do it uh, with twelve firms, uh, I, I knew that it was it was going to take time, and we needed to take a a date get engaged, get married approach. So that was over 24 months. And that's interesting to hear because some people get all excited about these things and they, they run into a sh- sort of a shotgun wedding. Um, and you're saying that you learned f- from your late father that um, that it was possible, but you just sort of went through the engagement, dating, et cetera. So it was make haste slowly. Is that right? Yeah. You look, I, I, think, I think one of, one of the lessons that I learned from him that that has really stuck with me, I, I think, just in in life, but it's certainly applicable to this, is that if if you recognise conflict, bring it forward and deal with it. And I think to to bring four firms that's together, an awesome quote, Kieran. We, we we should highlight that quote. That's a good one, mate. We'll chuck that in the links. So I, yeah, I think that you know when when we were looking at alternatives to doing what we were doing, we saw that missing in a lot of the other options that were available. So we we really focused in that 24 months in ensuring that if if we're going to come together, that you know all of all of the issues that would come up if we didn't deal with them about would have been some pretty interesting and hairy boardroom chats around because you're sitting in there and going, well, let's all think of the most terrible outcomes and put them on the whiteboard. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I, and and look, I think some things are uh, easier than than others. Uh, you know, in investment philosophy is is always a, a tricky one. Advisors tend to be pretty passionate about that one way or another. Well, you led this interview saying that you had positions on it. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks for that. <laughs> It'll be good when they're listening to this. <laughs> and and maybe um. Uh, before we get into the, the new co, and maybe give me a bit of a feel for, or give the listeners a feel, sorry, for um, advice wise. Um, sort of, how was it organised? How, how many ARs were in advice wise? Uh, so we had 
we had, I think we had four or five yep. when um, uh, before we came together with the other firms. And and, and um, the rest of the business, how was that? Was that to, you have uh, power planners? Maybe give us a feel for what that business was because it wasn't not substantial anyway, was it? No, look, we we worked. Well, I think one of we are fortunate to have uh, you know a whole bunch of uh, mentors uh, over the course of the last ten years or so in advice. You can and give them a shout out if you want; they might listen. Yeah, so for a long time, um, we had Jim Kilkenny and David Heinz on uh, the advisory board, and I believe Jim has now rolled into being on your board, if not the, the chair. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, very and, good. Um, and still talk to David regularly. At, yeah. uh, David loves a chat. Yeah, he does. if you're listening, David, uh, another successful uh, sort of uh, prodigy. There you go. And and look, they that they were, you know, their their help was um, uh, was fantastic the the whole way through. Uh, but I think one of one of the the key uh, learnings from them is that you 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 need to be ready for today, but also for tomorrow. So we 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 built our business, whether it was technology or people or anything else, with um, you know what do we need to have in place to deliver today, but what and whom uh, do we need to have in place to make sure that. Uh, we can grow sustainably over time. So, so what does that mean, though? Right. So, so you mentioned tech, you mentioned systems. Um, what did you put in place that you felt you had excess capacity or could scale? Yeah. So, so I think that what what I've always wanted to have in place, and you know, now, or, and we had the we had the bones of it in advice wise, but with the scale that we have now. We're we're starting to to roll that out in a richer sense is to have a, a professional services structure for our people uh, in the same way an accounting firm does or a, a law firm does. So is that the career trajectory? Yeah. So what does yeah. that mean? Well, what it means is that if I walk in the door um, at uh, an associate level or a client service level, I've I've got a clear path. Um, and a clear understanding of what I need to do um, to become an advisor, to become a senior advisor, and to become a partner in the business. Or if it's on the operations side, you know, what do I need to do, whether I'm in marketing or, or tech or finance or whatever the case might be, um, what do I need to be doing to progress my career as well? So we've we've always been a business that, that looks to... Um, uh, you know, bring the next generation through. So, um, you know, at Advise Wise at that time, we had um, an advisor in his PY year. Um, we've got a pretty steady stream of that now. He's finished that and is now an advisor. Um, we've got another uh, another lady, Ewer, in her professional year, and um, we have another associate advisor who will kick that off later in the year. So, I think you know, having that that talent pipeline is is critical to our business achieving what we would like to achieve in you know the coming years and i think one of the keys to that which is lacking in uh, a lot of businesses um in financial advice is that path like yeah the career path so so if i'm coming in today to for a job interview per se you're not just telling me about the job of today, you're telling me about the career of tomorrow, correct? Yeah, and I, I want you to be a partner in our business. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a growth, that's a growth story. And um, on the actual ground, so if, I'm, if I come in as an advisor or in operations or, or power planning, how do you arrange the um, – uh, is it in a pod system? Do I look after a certain number of clients? Or maybe we'll backtrack. Historically, advice-wise, you had a few niches. Okay, you mentioned medical. You've, you've, you've got quite a, an experience with, with women-specific financial planning as well, which feel free to elaborate on. But um, where did the clients come from and what are the kind of types of clients that you think are, 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 are the best fit for you guys? Yeah, okay. So uh, the clients, clients have come from uh, centres of influence. Clients, I, I think clients more than anything have come – from clients, uh, and uh, at advice wise, over the first uh, is we made I think three bolt on acquisitions, um, and the third of those, the third one of those uh, was a specialist in 
financial advice uh, by women for women. But I, I think as what what I'm encouraging in our business and what we're working towards is uh, kind of a house of niches approach. And what do I mean by that? I think as as an advisor, I think you you want to get to a point where you know all day every day you're working with people that are interesting to you that that you like having that relationship with and where the the advice that you're providing is interesting and challenging and I suppose from a business perspective that means if you've got these common groups that your process is going to be more effective what do you when you mention the advice is interesting um, I like that comment because ultimately uh, you know we do thirst for intellectual rigor so what would you define as an interesting piece of advice in in, in your world uh, yeah, look, I, I think um, uh, for me, uh, as I said, I, I've specialised over the course of time probably in, in two um, main areas, working with um, you know young families, uh, so 35 to 55, uh, who uh, are predominantly in, in corporates and as the way I would describe them is, is they like to delegate. You know, yep. They work somewhere where they, they've got Teams of people around them in in a big corporation, um, and they're used to asking for help. They're used to having someone mow their lawn and you know iron their clothes, and uh, so they they're used to delegating. So um, they they make great clients because they're um, they they value uh, time, yeah, and they yep. value expertise, yep, yep. Um, and you know, really, that's the you know the, the their most precious commodity is time, and. Handing that over to us means they can accomplish more in, you know, their personal and professional lives. It gives me a, a good, good um, a reference point just to, I suppose, confirm where it is that you're located. Which is um, uh, your new co is in Governor Philip Tower in 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 the CBD of Sydney, and um, or you've historically been in and around Sydney. In fact, when I went to your offices, you were on the water um, and Darling Harbour, so uh, King Street Wharf. So um, uh, that was a fun office, to be brutally honest, and. Uh, um, but now the view is probably spectacular. Yeah, look, I, I, I think that you know, an, an office is uh, uh, a few things. It's a statement of who you are to, uh, to your clients, uh, to your team, um, and to the market. It's, it's also, uh, you know, I think that with, with hybrid working now, um, we, we want our team to have that flexibility. So, so what is the policy? Uh, so look, I, I think at the moment, most of the team would spend, you know, three or four days in the office. Um, generally speaking, we're three and two. Yep. Some people choose to be in more. Um, sometimes people are in less because, you know, they've got to walk the dog or something's going on with the kids. Uh, so, you know, we're all adults. We, we trust people to deliver the results. So, uh, yeah, we we have that that hybrid working, but I, I think you you want an environment that it's it, people feel good about coming into. And oh, as as the CEO, you've got to earn people's commute. You know, so if someone's travelling an hour each way, they want to come to a great environment. I think um, that's that's completely been recrafted by by COVID. Um, and so you've got these clients that are that are, are delegators. Um, they're professionals. Quite often, they're in that accumulation phase. No doubt you've also got other clients in pre-retirees and whatnot, which means that your business client base is growing with your 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 team. And as you bring on 20, 20 and 30-year-olds, then they're not that far away from the clients, 10, 15 years, which is a great niche. Um, do you have, uh, with your engine room, do you, you, do you have outside contractors for power planning, for administration, for any of your other services? Yeah, look, we we have a uh, we do so uh, we use a, a team in the Philippines, uh, and they they kind of uh, the first level of uh, uh, of work. So they do they do a lot of the admin, they do the baseline for our research, uh, for client communication, um, for advice generation. So how long have you had that team? Jeez, uh, um, probably six years. That's a long time, right? Yeah. So, um, I, by myself personally, I, I had a team for sort of 10, 12 years, and um, uh, there will be people listening and always ask this question. Um, uh, why do you think 
you've been successful over six years in in, in integrating them in because that was pre COVID even right. So that was in a time where everyone in Australia was in the office and they weren't. What did you do, or what 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 culture did you instill that made them feel part of the team? Well, I think it's exactly that, Andrew. I think it's them feeling like they're a part of the team because they are, and they're just as valuable as anyone else. They're just located somewhere else. And I think that that gets easier COVID and post-COVID, um, where there's more people sitting on on Teams and, and Zoom. Um, but I think it, it's it's making the effort to, to understand them and understand their culture uh, and you know, making sure that uh, they participate in, um, you know, the the team building events, and uh, so you know, we we make a conscious effort to to have events that include them as well, because obviously we can't take them bowling or or whatnot. But you know, we we've done a um, a team quiz for I think the past four year the four years the same advisor. Keeps winning that. Who's so, that? Give him a uh, shout out, Jane Mitchell. So she would be <laughs> happy for the rap. Uh, but that—that's a you know we do that once a month. It's a it's a great way to get um, the whole team here and um, overseas together, uh, and you know have a bit of a laugh. The the topics are all uh, uh, put forward by by the team, so you get everything from uh, Harry Potter to astrophysics. Uh, but uh, I think it's just that it's it's making them a, a feel and actually be a, a really important part of the team. Oh, absolutely, I couldn't concur more. And, and um, uh, I'm going to throw a, 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 a curveball in here. So um, it sounds like you've got that worked out, you know. And it's it's a necessary part, you know, doing third party authorities, getting that engine room, and freeing up your Australian team to be able to see clients more and do that. So that works for advice wise. But with the three other businesses, how are you going to integrate that philosophy or are they already doing that given that you've been in the chats for two years? Yeah, so we're not, we're not a million miles away. One of, uh, one of the other firms uh, had or has, sorry, uh, are using outsourcing in the Philippines as well with uh, the, the same group. So that might, makes life pretty easy. Absolutely. Um, I, I, think, I think when you bring four firms together, uh, the what you've got to do with a lot of these things is take uh, or even two firms uh, take a step back um, to take two forward. So um, you can't you can't put four advice processes together uh, and expect that to work. It uh, well, it all will frustrate everyone, and the profit will just drain out the bottom line, right? Yeah, yeah. So it it it's about uh, it's about getting back to that baseline. Um, Getting something in place that means that the client experience is the same or better, and then over time working on um, how can you incrementally improve advice um, by taking on board what each of those firms do really well. And um, uh, it's, it's early days, but that that obviously means that you've got your own sort of uh, non-negotiables about how you want to deal with clients and whatnot. Um, Couple of other quick questions. Um, uh, the licensing you're self licensed, and and so everyone will be, uh, you know, everyone's staying as a self licensed um, entity. Um, are you you owned by anyone else outside of the the people involved in the business? No, no, the the employees own the business. Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, and in relation to technology and 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 that tech stack, what's what's the the tech stack today, and what what do you think, if anything, will happen in in the near future, not the long future, because you know, Lord knows, but but the near future. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we the the center of our universe is uh, a CRM called Fin three six five, and um, advise wise, uh, and now going into a sense here, have used that for six years. Um, and when we originally made the decision to use that, um, there were a bunch of reasons, but the 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 number one reason is that Fin three six five sits in uh, Microsoft Dynamics, and we felt which, which which has now come back into their own, hasn't it? It, it, it's a, it really has. So it's like it's like a running race, and I see you know, and and everyone's running, and this is about four or five years ago, and everyone's like, remember that Microsoft thing? And then all of a sudden, you woke it up today, and it's gone boom straight yeah. past. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think that there, there's uh, there's a bit of luck 
in uh, making that call at the time. But well, you've been part of the advisory for, for Fin365 for half a decade. Yeah, I was I was an early investor as well. So, oh, there you go. Um, you know, I, it's always good when the guinea pig uh, becomes the hare, becomes the lion, right? So yeah, yeah. You look, I, I think that uh, I the 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 proposition and the technology and the team there. Uh, from day one, um, I was really impressed, yep. and uh, you know they they were in it for the long haul at at that time, and and I think that it's uh, it where where they've decided to build um, off the back of Microsoft. That's you know that's now really paid off. I think. Oh, absolutely, as you say, you, you, you hang around, you've got lucky on that one, but you have it because you've done the work. So that's doing your CRM, mm-hmm. and that will also allow you to, you know, in the future. At the moment, you're pure play financial services, but if you ever did get involved in any other accounting or debt or anything like that, it, it it allows you to, to I suppose, guide the client journey entirely. What about advice production? What about other things? Yeah, so so we use X-Plan for advice production. I think, you know, we've, we, we've periodically scoured the market uh, and there's, uh, you know, there's a, a bunch of tools out there that do some of the things that X-Plan do really well, but, you know, I think X-Plan is still the the best integrated tool for producing advice um i think what to to the second part of your question earlier i think one of the one of the things we're looking at um and and doing something about now and and into the future is uh how do we take advantage of the microsoft universe um because the less uh the, the less systems from different vendors you've got uh, the the easier your life is. Well, it's been a um it, with Ensemble, um, uh, you know, as we've embarked on a, a bunch of development sort of stages. Um, in the last two years, we've realised that Microsoft has given us a massive leg up and probably saved us countless time and dollars to get to the outcome we wanted. Um, so shout out to to Bill. I hope he's, he's, oh, he's a big listener. Karen, is that right? Yep, he's nodding there, nodding there. So um, yeah, shout out there. Yeah, look. So we're 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 about to move from a uh, a marketing automation system called Active Campaign to Click Dimensions, and Click Dimensions is built natively into Microsoft Dynamics. So it means um, when and we use marketing automation both for nurturing leads and for our um, our existing client experience. Uh, and we we felt again now with the the scale that we have that uh, using that system, which is more expensive, uh, but because it's natively integrated into Dynamics, it it means the provided we've got the data, we we can use that you know impersonal technology in the background to increasingly personalise our experience with clients. So a couple of things there. One is you, you mentioned the scale. So what, what is the what is the scale of retained families in, in the new code? Yeah, so we've got I think we've got seven hundred or so client groups. Yep. So And how many ARs in the new code? Uh ten. Ten. Okay. Okay. So um and you also have spoken so when I interview practices, there are different stages of building their capacity cup. You've obviously pulled the trigger and you mentioned you've got nurture campaign which insinuates that that you are also focused on funneling in new clients that are appropriate into your business. What is your new business aspiration on an annual basis? Oh, uh, look, I think at at the moment it's it's minimal because uh, we. But you're doing the work with the nurture camp. Yeah, yeah, you're doing we the are, work with the branding. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So so I think uh, ultimately uh, we we want that to be um, continue to be a, a double digit. Number, um, but again, you need you need that backbone there in in the business. So we've got, you know, one of the decisions we made coming together was uh, that we needed to make sure that we had that capacity and continue to have that capacity. Um, so it's it's probably double digits. Um, that's it's awesome. what we've done uh, in the past. So it's what I, I'd expect us to do into the future. And I um, we were chatting earlier um, beforehand, and I sort of said, "Well, you know, are you looking to expand your wings and and, and go other places?" And you said that you're open to um, working with practices in both Brisbane and Melbourne as well. Do you have a, a presence there currently? Uh, we don't in in Brisbane and Melbourne. Uh, I think what what we'd like to identify 
um, are, are firms that that have a you know a long term view on being the best of the best. Uh, so you know our our shareholders are you know twenty eight through sixty one. How many um, shareholders you got roughly? Uh, seven. In in that combined UK, yeah, 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 yep. yeah. and but but I think you know our our team, you know, across the board is 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 pretty young. So we're we're, we're able to have that that long term view. Um, well, mate, given that you've got two children under the age of five, I don't care how old you are, you've got to be young. Yeah. <laughs> he's laughing. He's speechless. <laughs> he's nodding. He's nodding in appreciation of the of the joy. <laughs> And and excitement for the next twenty five years are going to give him. Um, and when you're sort of so you are you're, that that expanding is there now. Um, that answers the question around you've got a, a hybrid office approach. Um, if I'm working in your business, what are the cadences of meetings? What are the non negotiables? How do you run? What's the pulse? Because as it gets bigger and you're in the C suite, if you get too far away, you know what happens, and it's not nice. So what? does your business do on a daily or weekly basis to tie them back to the outcomes? Yeah, so I, I think it's uh, it, it's about having a, a framework for advisors to work to. Um, I think when when I, I do a I do a session each month with our um, our associate advisors and our, our younger advisors and that's uh, that's always focused on um, soft skills. Um, so whether it's uh, whether it's comms, whether it's so are you the actor who puts the moustache and the and the, the the long wig? Is that right? Oh, I think it's uh, I think it's a bit of uh, experience is the name men give to their mistakes. So Perfect. Trying to make sure they don't do uh, what I've done, but uh, I think one of, one of the things that I I try to get through to them is that you know you that the advice process is the advice process, but what what we need to do as a business is give you uh, a, a framework that's broad enough that uh, you you can use and be your style and be yourself. So they can have your flair, right? So so that framework, that that spine of the business, um, where you've got clients that are doing annual opt ins and you've got new ones coming through. Um, who in your organisation is accountable for that quality assurance? Yeah, so we we've we've got two layers to that. I suppose we've got three layers to that. We have uh, the the associates work with the the client service team to make sure that uh, they're ready to go and they get out and they get signed. And they're doing they're doing a lot of that sort of uh, annual review packs. You're getting the associates because also it's a good way of them are learning the the supply side, the products, the, the portfolios so they're doing that and then working with the, the the lead advisor on that client until what is is the transition ultimately where those advice associates when they do their py end up sort of working with those clients is that your plan yeah yeah so we i mean part of that professional structure which you know accounting firms and law firms do really well is that waterfall type of approach hand off hand up yep. yeah yeah and and if if you've got that um, that client team in place that makes that usually a, a pretty seamless transition. So. And also, you've got the carrot of being a shareholder, so it doesn't matter that you know you don't worry that much about your patch if it's for the greater good of the client and the the corporate, right? Yeah, yeah. And no, I think if if you and if you do a, a good job both with your clients and your people, um, those people as they become more senior advisors and partners in the business, they haven't gone anywhere. Um, so, you know, clients still tend to have a relationship with them, but uh, the day-to-day is, uh, you know, delivered by, um, you know, the bigger, better, faster, stronger associate who's, who's coming through. So on the daily one, I'm going to drill down on this because you definitely have, have articulated the training that you give, the soft skills, et cetera, which is excellent. But on a daily basis, do I do I have an administrative huddle? Do I have what are my critical numbers if I'm working in the business? The numbers that at the end of each month um, are, are, are what I live and die by. Yeah, look. So the um, the team has a, a fireside chat uh, each morning first thing. Um, so that's that's just to you know make sure we're on the same page. Yep. And yep. and that's first up, like yep. nine o'clock, eight thirty something. Yep. 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 So so that. 
that kicks off. Um, each advisor, uh, you know, you, you can rely on technology a fair bit for these things, yep. but uh, each advisor has a, a weekly uh, whip with uh, their pod. Um, and, and again, that's just, you know, the, the context that you can't get from, you know, Teams or, or Fin365 or email. Yep. You, you occasionally need to have a conversation. Uh, so, so we've got that in place. Uh, and, and in terms of, you know, how do we look at, at what's going on? Um, we, we use Power BI and we, we measure a lot of things. Um, but as far as, uh, what's, what's going on and how is everything going? Um, we use a, uh, I suppose what, what accountants would call an acti- activity costing system, but, but basically the team, uh, as they incrementally work on, on tasks, we'll note I've spent 15 minutes on this or half an hour on this. So you can get, although that's not the way you bill per se, it gives you visibility of time and motion study. Is that correct? Yeah. And, and look, it, it really, it really helps. Uh, I said when the further you get removed, the, the harder it is. But where, where it really helps is understanding where is help needed. And, or- and, and where are the surprises? So, you know, what did you think, what takes longer than you think? Um, in financial advice in 2024, yeah, it's a. a I, I think the probably the the biggest surprise overall um, is uh, I think when when you've when you've got clients top line, so you're charging them might be charging them, you know, twenty or thirty thousand dollars a year. Um, what what we've found is that uh, the 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 amount of time that uh, you know, particularly the more senior people in the business uh, spend on those clients is uh, compared to uh, you know those sort of professional families uh, accumulators uh, that we talked about earlier. That uh, there's really a, a substantial difference in uh, which way. Oh, oh there, there's a lot more time um, spent by a lot more people. So, so that's that's more your old show high net worth or, or, or people or families that. That and because uh, you, 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 the allure is that it's a bigger annual retainer. But when you've done the time and motion study, you're like, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So that was that was really really interesting when you start when you start to get that data, yeah, um, and you start to think about uh, you know not only um, what's my service model look like, but you know what's my pricing model look like. And do you have a fixed pricing model or service agreements? Uh, so- and will that will that come across into the new co as far as a a guiding operational principle. Yeah. So look, I, I, we we do is is the the short answer. Um, pricing, we we give the team some flexibility on that, um, so they can run with uh, a fixed index fee, or they can run with a hybrid fee. I think the the and part of the reason for that is the the philosophical argument on a um, an asset based fee. Um, on the one hand, is uh, if you're a skeptic, it's it encourages an advisor to um, to take more risk or to recommend more risk. But on the flip side, from a client perspective, they're saying, "Well, you've got skin in the game with me, and and I like that." So, so it's it's a perpetual conversation, and I don't, somewhere in the middle is correct, eh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we we leave them with some flexibility. I, I think as far as uh, you know, as far as our approach to service agreements, uh, we've we've got some legislation that you know hopefully is coming imminently uh, through the uh, pipeline. So um, where we're- sounds like you should probably organise this, right? If you can bring four firms together, let's let's try and bring four politicians together. Or right. is that or is that a, a bridge too far for you? Oh, it'd get it get done pretty quickly if it was me. <laughs> Don't you worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> we can edit that out because that sounds like a threat to people's <laughs> lives in Parliament there, Kieran. But um, no, you, you bang on there. And so what I wanted to also, um, uh, you know, you've spoken about the structure, you've spoken about your clients. Um, when your team does achieve their goals and, 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 and um, how do you celebrate? Um, you mentioned bowling, um, which down there in, in – uh, there was a bowling alley literally, I believe, underneath your office, so I think, for, for many years – but what does what does a celebration look like, and why would you do it? Yeah, look, uh, all all sorts of different reasons. I think um, it's it, it's both recognising uh, professional achievements. So, 
uh, whether whether that's promotions or that's uh, you know the the tenure with the with the business, um, but also equally importantly, uh, you know, personal achievements when you know someone buys a house or uh, they get married or they have they have children or because that's what you celebrate with your clients, isn't yeah, it? yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and I think one of one of the really cool things about being a leader is that if you're providing a career path and an interesting and challenging job for someone is that you you get to watch uh you know the the part that the small part that you play uh in those important milestones for your people as well as your clients so you know we had um uh, we, we've had someone uh, just have their their first child, uh, Malad. So Malad's looking uh, uh, pretty tired at the moment. It would be fair to say he said to he said to my wife uh, a couple of weeks ago that uh, I uh, I didn't know this was going to be uh, this hard. Uh, so welcome, <laughs> and you guys are like try four. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, absolutely, and. Um, you know, helping out your team because if, if you look after your team, they look after their clients. Exactly, and that's that there. Um, I also like to get a bit of a feel for um what drives people. And you opened up um this podcast with with a tragic story with 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 a great message, right, and a bit of inspiration. Um, but when I look at the charities that that you support, normally I ask the question, and and some people have supported one or two. But um, I'm on your website as we speak. And um, there's a treasure trove, you know, everything from Beyond Blue to the bowel cancer to the Smith family. Um, how do you go about um, selecting those? And is it democratised with your team? Uh, so a uh, short answer is is yes. So a, a, long, a long time ago in AdviseWise, uh, we... We thought about you know each each year clients might get a you know for Christmas might get a gift hamper or a voucher or you know a, a coffee cup or or whatever the case might be. Um, but but w- we felt that it would be more meaningful um, if we made a donation to a series of charities each year as our gift to them, um, and to get it to I suppose to get it. Um, uh, to work in a way that was uh, equally valuable to staff, uh, we we rotate around the team each year. So everyone's got a bit of a say. Yeah, yeah. So it's something. You know, all all of those uh, have been selected by members of the team um, for reasons that are you know really personally important to them. It um it's, it gives me a bit of a bit of a memory around. Um, <clears throat> we did an exercise, and it must have been. I'm going to get it wrong, but I'm assuming World Vision or, or or something like that, where you could give a goat to a family, and um, and uh, I, I don't think I'm going to give a shout out to the 500 goats that announcer gave out that year because they're probably they've probably had good fulfilled lives, but um, but when we did that exercise and stopped giving um as much of the sort of material presents to clients, which to be honest they're pretty wealthy anyway, right? Um, they got a lot more out of it. Um, and it was something that that um, quite a few of them I know then continue to support that in their own right. It was a bit of a trigger. So now it's great that you've you've done that, and that's going to be coming into the the new business. Um, in relation to uh, the future of this this vision, you don't bring four businesses in together without being aggressive and wanting to get bigger. You know, it's it's uh, it's sort of in your DNA, right? So. Um, What's your vision of the future? And I'm going to ask the question in two one. So I'm going to. I'm definitely keen on what's your vision for your future, but also if you don't mind, just stepping to the left and just saying what your vision is for financial advice practices in Australia, knowing full well that there are horses for courses. Yeah. Okay. So I'll I'll start with the second question. Uh, I think we've part of the reason why we're we're doing it is this that. Uh, I think this this generation of advisors and business owners have a, a really important opportunity that if if we get right, I think I think we'll have a uh, make a fundamental difference um, for tens, if not hundreds, of thousands of Australians. Um, and what what we need to do over the course of the next you know five to seven years is we need to be a profession. Uh, so there are a lot of steps being taken, and or have been taken, and continue to be taken uh, to to make that happen. But 
with with all of the change with the that we've had over the last five years with you know banks leaving um, more self licensing more private license uh, businesses I think what what we've got to what we've got to get to or the opportunity that creates sorry is for a bunch of great businesses to fill that gap that uh, that the banks and the institutions traditionally did. So what I'd like to see is four, five, six, whatever the case may be, um, you know, medium to large advice firms that have, you know, those have brands uh, and are known um, and deliver an experience that's that's first class so that financial advice uh, is regarded in the same way as as said as accounting is or or law is and you know is held in that esteem so uh, that's that's where I'd like to see uh, advice go and and that's the journey that we want to be on and that we're you know aiming to be uh, one of those players um, the the vision for our business is pretty simple um, I said it's about changing clients lives uh, so that's you know that's really the the first part. And Would it, you like to like you mentioned you've just under a thousand clients, and you mentioned ten thousands of you know you want to you want the industry to impact. You've got to do some heavy lifting. So you know have you got any stretch goals as far as five years on numbers of clients and whatnot that you'd love to get to? Because if I'm out there listening to someone who's built this and you're like, no, we're pretty good. We probably don't want to do anything more. Well, I'm not going to follow you up. But if you're like, yeah, we would like to get three x, four x, five x. Then I'm like, I think that I would love to sort of uh, take the opportunity, first of all, to come in as a paid actor, and then second of all, maybe to come in and have have a look at the business per se. Oh, well, we might get you in. I think that'd that'd be that'd <laughs> no be one pretty a paid actor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, uh, like uh, personally, the the sky's the limit. So uh, I think there are there are a lot of fantastic advice firms out there that you know we'd love to work together with. So, and when you say that, are you talking about uh, joint ventures, mergers, acquisitions, or, or, or a combination of all of those? Yeah, so I think two two things where we're looking for um, mergers where bring the uh, people as well. Like yeah, talent. yeah, where where they share the vision yep. that we have, and there's a cultural alignment. Um, so uh, we want people to stick around, and we want people to be partners and owners in the business. Um, but equally, we want to we wear it where it's available, and they tick those boxes uh, as well. Uh, we want to provide a path for people who are exiting the industry um, to leave their clients in a home where you know they feel um, you know happy, safe, and and secure that they're going to be looked after really well for you know a long time to come. That last point is very important, and it's underplayed. Um, if you spent fifteen, twenty years, or or longer nurturing these clients um, from, from, from the cradle to where they are now, it's just nightmare stuff that they could potentially be not serviced in that way once you've gone. So that's a, that's a, that's, that, that's a non-negotiable most of the time. And part of that is do you have the engine room to be able to handle absorbing the clients, correct? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And um, – the as you mentioned earlier, yes, there might be some legislative things, but I don't think we these days can put that into our business plan um, because it's always it's a, it's a moving feast. And the other people that will be listening here will be your new partners. So, um, do you have anything specific you like to uh, to uh, shout out to them? Oh, look, I think just that I'm uh, I'm really proud of of what we've already achieved getting to to where we are and um the the excitement uh, and energy in you know the new office with the the combined team is really really infectious and uh, so I, i'd like to thank you know them and you know in the last six months the broader team for you know such hard work and and for such uh, for showing such patience um they've all got a lot more patience than me um, but we wouldn't be here at this point without the the collective effort of everyone. Um, but for us, uh, I think that's that's just the um, the end of the beginning. Where um, oh, Winston Churchill quote. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Uh, it's been. I think we've been over a year before. It's one of my favourite. So it's the end of the beginning. 
Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So um, never, yeah. never give up. We'll throw that one in as well. There you but go. Bloody Gaston. And as a very interesting footnote to this conversation, when I asked you, because we had obviously hadn't spoken previously about you know what motivated you, and you gave us that great heartfelt story, and then I I asked um, who the insurance company was, and um, you actually mentioned the one who sponsored this podcast. Right. Because you unwittingly you didn't even know, and and so I put myself quite vulnerable there. So um, yeah, shout out to Zurich on that one, which is a a, a double thank you, and and with that. Um, I've enjoyed my time here, Matt, and um, I can see that you've got that that drive. Um, for those of you who uh, uh, are seeing this as well as listening to it, um, when in, when Matt's asked a question, he straightens up, his hands gesticulate. You know, he, he's really passionate in the delivery of of what he's doing. And and when I think about Ensemble and its whole purpose around the positive evolution of financial advice, the growing with the industry. And, and where it's going in the future, you literally couldn't be a more a perfect example of, of why we do this. So on behalf of the Engine Room and Ensemble, I'd like to thank you um, and wish you all the best of success. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Cheers, mate.